Luke 21, verses 10 through 24. Um, historically in the life of the church today is Palm Sunday. Um, we covered that a couple months ago in, in Luke chapter 19 as Christ was approaching Jerusalem. Um, and historically in the life of the church, Palm Sunday is preparing you for uh, what's called uh, the Holy Week or the Passion Week as, as Christ goes to his death. Here in our text in, in Luke 21, Christ has already entered. Palm Sunday happened. He already entered. Jerusalem, and here he's in the temple, uh, and he's, he's teaching everyone around him, not just his inner disciples, but everyone around him about what's coming in the years ahead when the Romans are going to invade and take over Jerusalem and lay siege. That'll be General Titus who will come in, and they will destroy the temple, take over Jerusalem. Gary was talking about that a little bit at 930. It's pretty brutal if you read Josephus' account. It, it is awful what happened. Christ is preparing his, the people listening for that to happen and saying, here's what's going to happen in the meantime, in the decades ahead. Here's what's going to happen. And Christ is doing that as he faces his own death as well, which is coming. So Luke chapter 21, verses 10 through 24. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be tears and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word and pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, speak to us uh, in, in these brief moments this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. One of the first successful daily newspapers in American history was a newspaper called the American Daily Advertiser. The American Daily Advertiser. It, was, it started being published in Philadelphia in the, in the 1700s, uh, and it had what you might expect from an 18th century publication. It had a lot of kind of advertisements, which is in the name, so a lot of ads for, you know, buy this product, buy this, buy this, uh, and then scattered amongst the advertisements, which paid for the paper, uh, there would be some, maybe a local news, a story out of Philadelphia or Boston or maybe Charleston, and then maybe some national news mixed in in this daily newspaper. And it was a pretty common newspaper that people would read and stay up to date on what was happening in their community and what was happening in the country and in the world. One day in September of 1796, the American Daily Advertiser surprised all of its readers. It shocked all of its readers of this daily newspaper because Readers got their newspaper on that day in September 1796, and the front page had your advertisements, maybe for, you know, to buy milk or buy, you know, dairy products here or buy your, your wood to build your chairs or your tables. that had that, and so you look through the ads, and then when you flipped over to the second page of the American Daily Advertiser, it, it said this on page two. Some important words in the history of America. It said this on page two. To the people of the United States, friends and fellow citizens... What followed after that greeting was the farewell letter from our first president, George Washington. It was the farewell letter to everyone because after 45 years of public service, he was going to be stepping down. He was not going to seek a third term as a president. And so after all of his years leading the colonies during the, the American Revolution and then being our first president, he was saying, I'm stepping aside from public life. I'm retiring. I'm done. And that was the, the, the context of what he was writing. He would no longer be serving the public. 
And some of you, you might have read this document or heard some of it. It's, it's interesting. I won't read all of it because it's a longer document. Um, and we might, we might fall asleep here and we have to be out by noon. Uh, but it, it's an interesting document. He, he gives President Washington, as he's going to leave office, he gives a couple things. He gives some warm wishes and some appreciation for everyone. Then he also gives some warnings about what's coming down the road, what they should prepare for. And so I'll just read a, a short quote from it. He says this, He desires that our union and brotherly affection may be perpetual. He says that the free constitution, which is the work of your hands, may be sacredly maintained. That its administration in every department may be stamped with wisdom and virtue. That the happiness of the people of these states under the auspices of liberty may be made complete by so careful a preservation and so prudent a use of this blessing, the Constitution, as will acquire to them the glory of recommending it to the applause, the affection, and adoption of every nation which is a stranger to it. It's remarkable. Then he adds this later on. He says, The name of American which belongs to you in your national capacity must always exalt the just pride of patriotism. He's trying to encourage what we'd call patriotism, nationalism, loving your nation, loving your country, working for its flourishing. And then he goes on to write about the, the problems he sees coming down the road. And, and there are really two problems. He, he worries about being entangled in things abroad, wars overseas. And then he worries about, or warns about, rather, the internal dangers here in the states. And he reminds, it's interesting, he reminds the northern states of their reliance on southern markets and southern ports, which would be you know, Charleston, Savannah, primarily. And then he reminds the southern states of our reliance on a lot of the northern ships and their production. So he says north and south, you, you, which is very, he, he saw a lot, it seems like, of what was happening in the country. North, you need to rely on the south. South, you need to rely on the north. You guys need to try to get along here, work together. And so if you read the speech, it's his farewell address to the nation as he leaves public office and he gives some warnings about things that are ahead. As we look at Luke 21, Luke 21 is essentially Jesus Christ's farewell address to the public. After years of teaching and healing and preaching, announcing the kingdom of God, doing unbelievable miracles, healing sick people, raising people, multiple people from the dead, Christ is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving public service, essentially. My public ministry is coming to a close, so this is his farewell address. And he's giving it to everyone that's listening around the temple. And here he's going to give some warnings. The last part of our reading from Luke was those warnings. He says, when it comes, when the Romans come in, essentially, don't come into Jerusalem. Flee, because you will die in the city. So he gives some warnings, but he also gives some promises that we're going to look at. We're going to look at three specific promises from this portion of what is really Jesus Christ's farewell address to the public as he concludes his ministry. The, fir the first promise here, I'm just going to be direct with you, the first promise here is a hard one to hear in the West. The first promise we're going to look at is a difficult one to hear. Jesus promises the people listening to him that are going to follow him, the, you know, Peter and James and John and others who we don't know their names. He promises them first, you're going to face persecution. Christ doesn't suggest that it might happen. Christ doesn't suggest that it's very likely that it could happen. Christ promises you will face this. And note the three sources of the persecution that Christ warns about that's coming in the, in the decades ahead. The first source is this, verses 12 through 15. It's, it's from the government. Verse 12, they will lay hands on you. It's assume you don't want them to lay hands on you. They're going to lay hands on you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you up to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors. Christ says that his followers are going to stand before political rulers and face persecution. They're going to face opposition. And if you think about those words, then you think about, you know, Luke wrote this. He's re recording this. Think about Luke's second volume, the Acts of the Apostles. You see a lot of this is fulfilled. A lot of what Christ says, you see the fulfillment even in the Acts of the Apostles. After Christ appears before Pilate and Herod and then is betrayed and executed on the cross, think about what happens after that in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter and John and, and Stephen appear before the Sanhedrin. Read Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 6. Stephen gives up his life. James appears before Herod Agrippa in Acts chapter 12. 
Paul appears before pretty much everyone available. Uh, Felix, Festus, Agrippa, everybody. Eventually, he ends up in Rome and loses his life. His life is taken from him. And so Christ says, persecution is going to come from government officials, and you see that throughout the Acts of the Apostles. The second source of persecution comes in verses 16 and 17. Look at what Luke records for us there. Your second source of persecution comes from your family. Family members will turn on each other. Parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Christ is saying, standing firm and following him is going to lead some of you to face persecution from the people you're related to, the people you spend the holidays with. Christ is saying it's not just corrupt government officials who are going to lay hands on you and persecute you. It's also going to be people who you're related to. Family members, wives, turning on husbands, kids, parents. That's the second source. Then finally, the third source of persecution that Christ promises here in verses 16 through 17. He says the final source of persecution is from your friends. Persecution from your friends. Persecution from the people you think you can count on when you're going through a difficult time. The people you think you can really lean on and rely on, those friends, they're going to turn on you. You think you can count on them, but Jesus says even friends will turn on friends. And it's interesting, if you, if you read some of the persecution that happened in, in the 60s, first century 60s, uh, under Nero, there's historians, uh, non-Christian historians, you might call them secular historians, who recorded the fact that Christians who were arrested turned on other Christians. They turned people in when Nero was burning Christians alive in Rome. Think about that. That's essentially, we just think for a second, that's essentially like church members turning on church members. Right? That's like if if I'll just borrow a few people. Right? That's like they arrest arrest Gary here for being a Christian, and Gary's like, well, you know, Spencer's a Christian. Um, And did you know Paul? Paul, he's a Christian too. You should get these guys. That's essentially what's happening. Gary wouldn't do that, of course. But that's essentially what's happening. It is people turning on each other. Oh, did you know Devin? He's a Christian too. You got to get him. That's essentially what Christ is saying is going to happen. Everyone's going to be, not everyone, many people will be turning on each other. That's the warning that he gives. And that's what happens. And it happens because, verse 17, it's not because they hate the Christian's as a person, as, you know, as a people group, it's because they hate Christ. It's because of who they're following. Verse 17, they will hate you for my name's sake. They hate Christ, and therefore, because you follow Christ, they hate you. That's coming. And so you think about that. What does that mean for us today? Because th- these words are originally directed towards the first century audience. But what does that mean for us today? Because, honestly, we've not faced meaningful persecution here in South Carolina. We have been spared. And so the first point there would be, Be thankful that you have not had to face that. But I think for us, the point of application here is we should not be surprised. We should not be shocked if God allows us to face that. It's not a a, a punishment. It's something that happens in God's divine plan. He decrees it. It's something that he allows to happen. And so we should not be surprised or shocked if we ever have to face that. If persecution comes from a a godless government official, we should not be shocked that that happens. It's happened before. If persecution comes from family or friends, we should not be surprised that that could ever happen. It's happened before. Because we live in a fallen, broken world, and and many folks do not want to hear the the gospel message. They do not want to hear it. They, They reject it. And because they reject it, they reject the followers of Christ, those who are sharing the gospel. Because for many people, the gospel is an offense. The Apostle Paul talks about that in his letter uh, to the Corinthians. It's foolishness. It's a stumbling block to those who are perishing. They don't want it. And if you're sharing it, they don't want to hear it. So you need to go away. Those who are offended by the gospel will often want to punish or censor Christians who live out the gospel and share the gospel. And we should not be overwhelmed by that. We should not be scared because of that, or fearful because of that. Because throughout the history of the Christian church, you read the history of of the Christian movement, there have been times of incredible expansion and fruit where the gospel goes out and you see 
just large-scale conversions to Christianity, but there's also been times of persecution and opposition where you think, man, there's not a whole lot of gospel going out. That was the context of the Reformation in many ways, leading up to, uh, to people like Zwingli and, and Luther and Calvin and, and Bullinger and others. The record of the early church here is that faithful followers of Jesus Christ were willing to face persecution, willing to face prison, willing to face death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. The history of the first century church is not really like the history of the 21st century church in America. They had challenges to their faith in the first century. We have it fairly easy. We have conferences and books about how God can make you healthy, wealthy, and wise and take care of all your problems, large mega churches that celebrate essentially you. Um, and, and I don't want to go on a rabbit trail on that. That's not the point. But that's, we kind of have it easy. We kind of have it nice and soft, and it's very easy for us in the 21st century. But in the first century, it was not that way. And so we should not be surprised if we face that. One first century historian wrote this. He said, in the first century, Christians as a class of persons were loathed. They were hated by the human race in the first century. We should not be surprised if we ever have to face that. We should not be overwhelmed, and we should be thankful that we haven't really faced meaningful, meaningful persecution. We should not, if we ever have to face that, not be overwhelmed or unprepared for it. If we do face opposition or persecution, we should not run to it and try to be a martyr and make ourselves great, get our name in the paper, but we should also not run from it either. We should not live by fear or cowardice either if we ha ever have to face that. And we've seen, you know, just in the last two years, as a quick aside, we've seen just some opposition for churches not to meet uh, starting back in 2020. Uh, and we've seen that throughout our, in, in, the, in the world, but also in our country where there was some opposition. I'm thankful that when things happened in 2020, Devin and, and Edward, who were leaders, we talked for a few minutes. It was a brief meeting. I said, what do you guys want to do? I know what I want to do. What do you all want to do? And we basically said, we're going to keep meeting. And when they closed the building, we went outside and we're going to meet. Um, but we, we did see some of that throughout our country. And we saw great examples in Canada and specifically in, in churches in, in California and some in New York where faithful pastors and even faithful rabbis who were shut down said, we're still going to meet because we do have a First Amendment and because we do know that we have to obey the Lord and we can't obey um, an, an edict from a mayor or from a governor that has no scientific backing and goes against God's word. We can't do that. And so we've seen faithful pastors in, in California, New York, some in, in Canada as well, who have faced arrest. We haven't faced that. We've been fortunate. I've been fortunate. We should be prepared. That's the point. We should be prepared, not living in fear, not running to it, not running away from it, but know that throughout the history of the church, the church has faced persecution, and that's okay. That's okay. God's still faithful. So that's the first promise. And if you're like me, you look at that first promise and you think, man, that's, that's kind of a negative start to the promises. Um, we might, might need a, like a more positive second promise here because that's a, that's a little challenging. And that, that's what we do need, and that's what we get. We do need some good news. The second promise is a little bit more easy for us to handle. We don't like, oh, promised prison, promised execution. We don't like that. We like something a little bit easier. And we get that here. The second promise is found in verse 15. Jesus says this. He says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. The second promise is this. He will give you wisdom. He will give you the words of wisdom to speak when you need it. He gives wisdom. And what's interesting here in the Greek, the Greek is emphatic. And so you could translate this in English as Jesus saying this. I myself, I, Jesus Christ, will give you wisdom. He is essentially saying, I have it in my hand. I am going to hand it to you personally. That's the personal connection there. I myself will give you wisdom. And think about the images that come to mind throughout the history of the Bible. Think of Moses, perhaps the most reluctant leader in the Old Testament. The guy really did not want to do what he was told to do. God tells Moses in Exodus 4, when Moses is like, I really don't want to go to Pharaoh. This is a bad deal. Like, I'd rather just hang out with the sheep out here and be away from people. Exodus chapter 4, God tells Moses, I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak to Pharaoh. God tells Moses, I don't really need you to say anything. I'm going to say it for you. I just need you to move your feet and get over there. 
I will speak for you. Or think in the New Testament. Think of Stephen, the first martyr in Acts chapter 6. He's facing the Inquisition, he's, and he's ultimately going to die. Many of you have read that story in Acts chapter 6. He's going to die merely for being a follower of Christ. Think of what he says here. In Luke, chapter, Luke writes about it in Acts chapter 6. As Stephen is speaking to them, Luke records this in Acts 6. They could not withstand the wisdom in the spirit with which he was speaking. They couldn't, they couldn't oppose the wisdom that he had as he faced death. Those are, that's a fulfillment, really, of, of this promise. And so pr- Christ promises you wisdom that will come directly from him through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you when you need it. In other words, when you face trials or opposition or persecution, which we, we really haven't faced, but when you face that, he says, I will give you wisdom. You don't have to prepare some, some prepared remarks. You don't have to write up a farewell address or have something written up and published. No, he says, don't, don't worry about it. I'll speak for you. I will give you wisdom. I will personally give you discernment and understanding and give you wise words to speak. That's, that's an encouraging promise, especially when you think about the culture that we live in, which is a culture, in many ways, devoid of wisdom. I think we could agree on that. There's not a lot of wisdom in 21st century American culture. Um, you might say, I mean, we have, a, we have some supply chain issues, whether it's food, maybe, or building materials. We also have a supply chain issue with wisdom. There's a shortage of wisdom in our culture. It's hard to find. It's hard to find. You don't find it on social media. You don't find it on TV, or on your phone. You don't find it in American entertainment. Instead of wisdom, you, you see men slapping men in award ceremonies, right? That's what we have. That's not wisdom. That's foolishness. We have a shortage of wisdom. And many in our culture don't know where to find wisdom. And many in our culture, if they did know where to find it, wouldn't care enough about wisdom to go and get it from the hand of Christ. But here Christ gives you that second promise. I will give you wisdom. I will give you wisdom because he is the wisdom of God. And so what Christ promises here is, he says, I will give you all you need in your hour of need. I will give you all you need in your hour of need. The the, the question for us is, do we believe that? Do we believe that? We should I don't know that Christ ever lied. I'm pretty sure he didn't. When he makes promises, he keeps promises. Christ says, I will give you everything you need in your hour of need. So promise number one is a tough one. Some persecution, some opposition. Don't be scared. Just be faithful. Promise number two, wisdom and understanding directly from the hand of Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you when you need it. He'll give you everything you need. And now promise number three. Promise number three. I'm going to tell you this through a story here. It's a story, a true story, about a man named Alexander. Alexander uh, lived in the 1970s in the former Soviet Union. And earlier, as a young man, a few decades earlier, he was uh, in his 20s, he, w- he converted to Christianity over in the former Soviet Union. He was arrested. He was arrested. He went to prison for his faith. Because he was, a, he was a Christian, an outspoken Christian, and outspoken on the, the need for religious freedom under the communists. And so, as punishment, the Soviet leaders sent him to one of the harshest prisons in the Soviet system. So Alexander, this Christian who's outspoken about faith in Christ, goes to one of these prisons in the Soviet system. And it's in, he's in like a group cell. It's, it's a lot of people. He's not a violent guy. He's a Christian. And so they notice that as Alexander's in this large kind of cell with lots of other prisoners, he is sharing the gospel with other people. And it turns out Alexander is an effective missionary in prison, much like the Apostle Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. You lock Paul up, he's just going to talk to the guys next to him. And there's going to be revival in the prison. So they notice that Alexander is sharing the gospel with other people in his group cell, and that's not really part of their plan. They don't want more Christians in prison. They want fewer. And so they remove Alexander from his group cell, and they put him in solitary confinement. They put him in lockdown, all by himself. And in that solitary cell, he was looked at by a single prison guard. An older man, an older prison guard, didn't say much. That was this prison guard's one job was just keep an eye on Alexander. He's not violent or anything, but he just needs to be not with other people because he's a missionary in prison. One night, the old prison guard comes into Alexander's cell, 
opens it up, comes in, and he sits down and begins to talk to the prisoner, Alexander. And let me quote what this old prison guard said in that small, dark prison. This is in the 1970s. I'm going to quote it here. He said this. He said, when I was a young prison guard in a different prison, he said they would gather 20 or 30 priests who had been behind bars, and they took them outside. They rigged them up to a sled so that they were pulling the sled, and they had them pull the sled out into the forest. They made them run all day until they brought them to a swamp. And then they put them into two rows, one behind the other. I was one of the guards who stood on the perimeter around the prisoners. One of the KGB guys walked up to the first priest. He asked him very calmly and quietly, Is there a God? The priest said yes. They shot him in the forehead in such a way that his brains covered the next priest standing behind him. He calmly loaded his pistol, went to the next priest and asked, Does God exist? Yes, he exists, the priest said. The KGB man shot this priest in the same way. We didn't even blindfold them. They saw everything that was about to happen to them. The old prison guard finished his story to Alexander in that solitary confinement cell by saying this. He said, not one of those priests denied Christ. Not one of those priests denied Christ. They all knew what was coming. I read that story. I was reading it this past week, and it leaves you almost speechless when you think about what actually happened there. There's not a whole lot to add, but it's from that story that we see really the third promise here in Luke chapter 21. The third promise is the best promise of all. Verse 19 is that promise. Christ says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Christ offers, He promises, He guarantees eternal life. Faithfully following Him, persevering in the faith, enduring in the faith, leads to eternal life. And so when those, those Russian priests stood side by side facing a pistol directly to their forehead, they were being faithful. They were persevering. They were enduring to the end. And when they lost their lives at the sound of that pistol firing, they gained eternal life. They received that promise of eternal life. They left that dark, dirty communist prison and entered into the light of the presence of the triune God at that moment. The beatific vision, life eternal, the presence of the triune God. Christ promises you, if you persevere with Him by the power of the Holy Spirit, He's going to do it for you then you gain eternal life. And verse 19 literally reads in the Greek, you will gain your soul. We live in a culture a lot of people have lost their identity, don't know who they are, lost their soul to who they are, their being. Christ says, you will gain your soul, life forever, if you persevere to the end. Jesus says, if you faithfully follow him, you gain eternal life. There's not a price you can put on that. You will gain your soul. And so whether your life is pretty pain-free, pretty relaxing, pretty easy, or whether your life is difficult and you face trials and troubles, whatever it is, you're somewhere in that spectrum. Christ says, just endure to the end with Him. We, we sang it a moment ago, abide with Him. That comes from John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, remain in me. And the promise is you get eternal life. And you get eternal life not because... You've done a good job enduring and because you've earned it. Not because you're good enough, not because I can deserve it. You persevere to the end and you gain eternal life because it demonstrates who you belong to. That's why you receive eternal life. Enduring to the end reveals that you belong to the one who endured to the end of his life at the cross. That's what it demonstrates. You can, you can endure whatever the Lord directs into your life because Christ has already endured the cross. He was betrayed by friends. He was arrested. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was executed on the cross for the glory of, of God's justice, but also to demonstrate His mercy on your life to redeem you from sin and from death. You can endure because He's already endured everything for you. 
the Son of God came and went to the cross and died for us and rose again. That is the promise. You have eternal life because of what He's done. Endure because He's already endured for you at the cross. And this morning as we come to the Lord's table, it's a sign and a symbol, a seal of the fact that Christ gave up His life on the cross for you. His, his body was broken. His blood was shed. Not because He had sins to atone for, but because His people have sins, many sins to atone for. And a sacrifice has to be made to cover that, to honor God's justice. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, think about that. Reflect on God's grace, His mercy, that He has endured to the end. And because of that, we can endure. Let's pray.